de Ardennen 50 jaar geleden. In de mistige ochtend van 16 december 1944 opende 2000 Duitse kanonnen het vuur. Het is het begin van Hitlers Ardennenoffensief dat dood en vernieling zaait in ons land. 3000 burgers komen om. Die winter van 1944, na de invasie in Normandië en de snelle opmars door Noord-Frankrijk, was het geallieerd offensief wat stilgevallen. Toch voorspelde de geallieerde legertop dat de oorlog tegen kerstmis afgelopen zou zijn. Maar in de rustig gewaande Ardennen was het front zwak bezet. Slechts enkele divisies, bijna zonder gevechtservaring. Daartegen wist Hitler in het grootste geheim en onder de neus van de Amerikaanse militaire inlichtingendienst een troepenmacht van 600.000 man samen te trekken. In de vroege ochtend van 16 december vielen de superieure Duitse panzerdivisies aan over een front van 100 kilometer. De geallieerden waren compleet verrast. Aanvankelijk weigerde de legertop zelfs te geloven dat het om een grootscheeps Duits offensief ging en zo ging kostbare tijd verloren. De paraatheid van de geallieerde troepen liet de wensen over en de versterkingen hadden veel tijd nodig om ter plaatse te komen. Het Ardennenoffensief kostte de geallieerden uiteindelijk zo'n 85.000 manschappen van wie 20.000 doden, negenmaal zoveel als op D-Day. Over dat Ardennenoffensief maakte het Amerikaanse ABC 30 jaar geleden een documentaire. De film zet de heldendaden van de GI's flink in de verf, maar minimaliseert de flaters en de nalatigheden van hun legerleiders. Geen woord ook over de Britse opperbevelhebber Montgomery, die de Amerikanen op de valreep uit hun hachelijke positie heeft gered. De documentaire bevat een schat aan Amerikaans en Duits archiefbeeld, dat in werkelijkheid zonder geluid is gefilmd en oorspronkelijk dus zo klinkt. In de ABC-versie wordt het zo. Acteur Arthur Kennedy vertelt het grootste epos uit de geschiedenis van de Amerikaanse GI's. Hallo, ik ben Arthur Kennedy en we zijn op Elsenborn Ridge in België. De climactische battle die de Tweede Wereldoorlog brengt tot het einde was fought hier. It was also the greatest pitch battle ever fought by Americans. The only major engagement ever waged by the United States in winter. And the 250,000 GIs who fought here did indeed create the great new legends of the brave rifles. The forces that gave rise to this new American legend were born in the demented mind of Adolf Hitler, whose view of America was distorted and second-hand. Even when America entered the war and by June of 1944 had joined successfully with the British in the landings in Normandy, Hitler retained his own propaganda image of the Americans as soft and decadent. And he became increasingly drawn to an obsession that the Americans were the weak link in the Grand Alliance then threatening to encircle him. But for the Americans, these were the golden days of liberation when the Allied love affair was new. Champagne moments when all these people in one brief bubbling over of passion cast off years of defeat and gave us their hearts. And in exchange, we gave them cigarettes and chewing gum and freedom. turns playing Errol Flynn. They'd let A Company liberate the first city of a day, then B Company would liberate the second one. Never had it so good. All the way from Saginaw, Michigan. Too shy to ask a girl for a kiss. And all of a sudden, the French girls, they're kissing me. Wait till I get back. Pucker up, I'll tell my girl. There's something I learned while serving my country. As 
That warm summer embered into autumn, disasters like falling leaves descended on Germany. And Hitler realized that to remain on the defensive would be to wait for death to come. And so he formulated a desperate plan for reversing the tide. Trapped between the Russians moving in from the east and the Allies from the west, he planned a gigantic surprise attack against that spot where the Allies were weakest and most overconfident. In Belgium, against the decadent Americans spread in far too thin a line along the Ardennes, his panzers would break through, re-seize the port of Antwerp, split the Allied armies in two, and in history's greatest reversal, he, Adolf Hitler, would turn imminent defeat into final victory. For this last offensive, the Germans secretly hauled every last reserve of arms and men to the Belgian border. There, the rows of powerful new panzers were reviewed by 29-year-old SS Colonel Joachim Piper, whose panzers were called the Blowtorch Battalion, because in Russia they'd found joy in burning defenseless towns and shooting unarmed civilians. Once again, Hitler held the dice, betting everything he had on this final all-or-nothing offensive, moving three secretly assembled armies to the tiny Ardennes sector and gambling on the seasonal storms of December. For as long as Allied airplanes were grounded by bad weather, the Nazi armies could attack in surprise, break through, and Hitler was sure, win. For the Allies, the Ardennes was a comparatively peaceful area where new divisions could be gently inoculated in combat and even find time to romp in the snow. And by December 15th, 1944, the GIs here were thinking mostly of Christmas. But the thoughts of these SS Panzer men were far less peaceful. They knew what they'd done in the past. They shared the desperation of their leader, Adolf Hitler, and they fully understood the battle orders now issued to them Soldiers of the Western Front, we gamble everything. This battle, above all, must be fought with brutality in a wave of terror. Thus lives our Germany. By nightfall, 250,000 exhilarated Germans moved silently into attack positions. Across from them, 100,000 Americans slept unaware. At dawn, December 16th, a surprise reveille sounded for the Americans in the Ardennes. Within an hour, GI outposts and communications were knocked out and their vehicles set afire. Then the shelling ceased and from the cloak of fog, German infantrymen emerged, more and more of them faster and faster. Panzers joined the attack. 30 crack German divisions with complete surprise had launched a full-scale offensive against only six American divisions. Especially in the center and south of the Ardennes, the surprise German tidal wave seemed invincible. Exultant, the German infantry strode past dead GIs and burning American vehicles. Spearheading the Panzer breakthrough, Piper and his blowtorch battalion pulled their way past every obstacle, raced all night, and by dawn of the second day were deep behind the American lines and still rolling unopposed toward the great goal of Antwerp. But at a 
crossroads near Malmedy, the Panzers ran into a lightly armed American artillery observation battalion. About 150 GIs surrendered, a highly unwelcome burden to the blowtorch battalion that had to keep moving. So they herded the GIs toward an open field, and suddenly an SS man fired at them. Then another fired. Then eight machine guns combined mass production with mass murder. They'd had orders to wage a campaign of total terror, and this was it, a rabats. Rabats, the SS word for joy and killing. The SS Panzers then raced on, regarding the murder of 115 Americans as trivial in the crossroads at Malmedy, not worth holding. But miraculously, a few prisoners survived and escaped to tell their tale, a tale that spread to every GI in Europe, especially once the snow-covered bodies of the victims were found and counted and removed for proper burial. For three years, the G.I.s had fought with no emotional spur, hating war, but not really hating the enemy. Now, from Almady on, there would be a new G.I., spurred by hatred and the realization that he could never surrender. If you were to die anyway, then die fighting. There's still another weapon in his campaign of total terror. Hitler the gambler had loaded the dice. He had assigned Scorzini, the top Nazi commando, to secretly train a brigade of 2,000 English-speaking SS men to act like Americans, to chew gum perpetually, and issued captured GI uniforms and vehicles to seize bridges, give false orders, and spread terror everywhere behind the American lines. But only seven German-driven jeeps ever got through, and when just one of those seven jeeps began running out of gas, its English-speaking spy team asked some GIs where they could get some petrol, please. They spoke in the wrong kind of English. The real GIs captured them, searched them. Beneath the American outer uniforms, there was German underwear. This German then revealed the existence of an entire brigade of English-speaking saboteurs. Confused and suspicious, the GIs then improvised roadblocks everywhere behind their lines, not only interrogating civilians, but each other. looking for a cross when you'd every bed in Bush in Belgium. Trouble was, how could you tell one if you found one? Wearing our clothes, driving our jeeps, speaking English as good as you and me. I stuck my M1 into the belly of everybody who went by. Do feet on up to Big Brass and I ask questions. Like, uh, who plays left field for the Red Sox? Who's off in Annie's old man? And, uh, what's the capital of California? And they better answer right back, San Francisco. While the Americans were confused, the German generals kept dispatching angry orders to their divisional commanders. Schnell, Max Schnell, get moving. If there's opposition, bypass it, but get on. Break through today, tomorrow at the latest. They must take three essential objectives. Elsenborn Ridge, St. Vith, and Baston. The Belgian refugees spread the news of the German breakthrough and through all of newly liberated Europe, pessimism spread like a plague. A pessimism that seemed justified, especially with the two surrounded regiments of the 106th Division already discussing procedures for surrender. Yet hundreds of the young GIs of this division, refusing to surrender, slipped off into the dense forests and fought their way out to freedom. 
And Lieutenant Eric Wood of Bedford, Pennsylvania, repeatedly risked his life to get just three of the 12 big guns he commanded out ahead of the onrushing Germans. Once his guns were safely out, he slipped off into the forest and for days led a band of American guerrillas that terrorized the German rear. When Wood was found in the forest dead, the bodies of seven dead German soldiers were found with him. But the majority of the surrounded 106th Division surrendered. Except for Bataan, the greatest mass battlefield surrender in American history. Desperate to stop the German breakthrough, Company C of the 740th Tank Battalion, never before in combat and having just arrived in Europe without any equipment of its own, worked all through the night and most of the day cannibalizing 25 crippled tanks in order to get just 15 in running condition. Now these 15 patched up heaps of armor, many without radios, spare parts or extra ammunition, headed east. These combat virgins were out looking for Germans. Soon they found them, the blowtorch battalion, the blood-soaked veterans of Russia and Malmedy. And these experienced panzermen had heavier tanks and bigger guns. But the GIs were faster on the draw. It went up in flames. Then another of Piper's tanks rounded a curve into range. And the second Nazi tank caught fire. Then a third Panzer poked around the curve. Again, the lead American tank fired first. And the third German tank burst into flames. The Nazis had had it. Piper's up to now invincible panzers, the leaders of the German breakthrough retreated and raced back for safety. Inspired by this amazing reversal, the American infantry raced after the fleeing panzers and surrounded them. The blowtorch battalion would no longer be a factor in the great battle. The night of Piper's defeat, other Germans throughout the gloomy Ardennes began seeing and hearing ghosts. In the north, one group saw the lights of what seemed to be a huge American convoy. Actually, Major Robert E. Yates of Marshall, Texas, kept sending his six trucks up the road with their lights on, then down again with their lights off, round and round all night, the same six trucks. Convinced they had run into an entire American division, the German tankers put off their attack in this sector. Similarly, outside Bastogne, the Panzermen suddenly held up their drive, as if afraid of the darkness, afraid of the fog, afraid of the ghost-like American army. They spent a nervous night listening to strange noises, And while this much stronger German force watched and waited, the 101st Airborne that morning rolled unopposed into Bastogne. In addition to the newly arrived paratroopers, all that defended this absolutely essential objective were elements of the 10th Armored Division, hastily camouflaging themselves for winter warfare, a few artillery units, including a veteran battalion of 155 millimeter gunners, and a ragtag collection of stragglers called Combat Team Follow-Up, who as individuals chose to stand and fight. As for the Germans, their fears had vanished with the night. In daylight, they quickly snapped a steel ring around Baston. And Hitler's incredible luck with the weather was still holding. As soon as the Bastogne trap was shut, a heavy snow began to fall throughout the Ardennes.
For now, this climactic battle had a distinctive shape and name, the Bulge. And to Adolf Hitler, the G.I. Hell Peninsula of St. Vith looked like a knife that could cut the throat of his all-or-nothing offensive. And so he sent direct orders to Baron von Manteuffel to take St. Vith at once and at all costs. For three straight days, Manteuffel had sent six of his divisions against St. Vith, which was held principally by only one American division, the 7th Armored. Battered again and again, the badly outnumbered GIs somehow held on, though their ranks became steadily depleted and their ammunition dangerously low. Hitler the Baron determined on one last climactic attack. All day long, therefore, he sent tide after tide against the few Americans who still held St. Vith. But by day's end, Manteuffel's divisions had again failed to take the town. So they continued the attacks on an even larger scale, on into the night. Finally, the battered survivors of the 7th Armored Division were ordered to pull out. Against overwhelming odds, these men had somehow held on to St. Vith for seven days and seven nights. They had, in the words of Winston Churchill, performed the highest acts of soldierly devotion. When did courage come? When you're young, you don't believe you can die. Only here, you soon wise up. The moment comes when every soldier stands apart from his living self stares into his own grave, becomes his own chief mourner. All that first night of combat, I cried to myself. What a waste for me to die, I cried. So young, so strong, so full of desire. By dawn, I'd run dry of tears. I realized the world will go on without me. The world will go on. And when you realize how insignificant you are, then you can accept your own death. Then at last you're a man. A man. And courage has come. Now that Adolf Hitler had St. Fifth, he demanded the other key prizes, Baston, and more important, Elsenborn Ridge. To the Elsenborn sector, Hitler had assigned his strongest army, the 6th Panzers, commanded by burly, boozing Sepp Dietrich, nicknamed the Butcher, since he'd started as a butcher in a meat market in Bavaria. But after six straight days of futile assaults against Elsenborn Ridge, Butcher Dietrich was drinking heavily and sending apologetic messages to his Fuhrer, promising they'd really break through at Elsenborn tomorrow, tomorrow for sure. But Hitler knew he was running out of tomorrows. He demanded Elsenborn today. One last massive assault, Dietrich then drunkenly demanded. When earth and snow and sky again were still, the butchers, panzers, and infantry moved out for the seventh straight day of assault on the snowbound ridge. On 
that sector the American 99th Division held. So too did the 2nd Division, and the 30th Division, and the 9th Division. But on the 1st Division sector, the Germans broke through, cleaving a gap a half a mile wide. Quickly, Dietrich shot reinforcements through the gap, confident that at last he could report to der Fuhrer they were on the road to Antwerp. But the 1st Division wasn't beaten yet. In the last of the 9th rally, they threw every last GI into the line. Steadily, individual riflemen picked off every German who moved. Within a few hours, no more Germans were moving. Every infantryman who had broken through was dead, and their bodies piled up and froze in the grotesque position in which they fell. Soon the drifting snow veiled this macabre ballet. These Nazi dances would not be seen until spring. The G.I.s here had made the greatest day-after-day day defensive stand the American army has ever made, and Hitler's hopes of a quick smash north to Antwerp were smothered in the snow of Elsenborn Ridge. At Bastogne, Hitler's third great goal, the besieged G.I.s exuded a brash self-confidence, the cockiness of those who had been consigned to hell and somehow survived. Thus, when a panzer delegation arrived with a surrender note, the G.I.s, even though surrounded, simply assumed it was the Germans who were trying to surrender. They breezily took advantage of the brief truce by shaving, eating, and catching up on their reading. While their commander, General McAuliffe, reflected the cockiness of his men, when to the Germans' formal demand for surrender, McAuliffe simply replied, nuts! McCullough's reply captured public imagination everywhere and obscured the fact that the persistent Hitler weather made an airlift of supplies to Bastogne far too great a risk. And though relief columns, both British and American, were on their way, it was doubtful if the steel cavalry could get there in time. Hitler's luck holds forever. On the eighth day of the great battle, Hitler's luck ran out. Suddenly the skies were cold and clear and filled with the American Air Force. In surrounded by stone, things were looking up. For on this day, neither flak nor fire would stop the Air Force from paying off on their promise to the foot soldiers below. Western sector, part of an artillery battalion with an entire panzer division at their heels rolled up to an obscure crossroads. They carried with them the very same three guns that in the first days of the German breakthrough, Lieutenant Eric Wood had fought and died a one-man war to save. As the battalion commander, Major Arthur Parker of Leeds, Alabama, studied his map, he came to the amazing conclusion that this crossroads controlled the paved highway to Antwerp. He was thus standing on the strategic key to Northwest Europe. Parker then decided that he and his three guns would dig in in the hills above and defend the crossroads if need be against the entire German army. In 
as other GIs fled through the road junction, Parker talked many of them into joining his impromptu combat team, though they knew they were making virtually a life or death choice. But the Germans could also analyze maps. They sent the entire 58th Panzer Corps against the tiny GI force. But the GIs, with a tremendous display of courage, beat off every attack. Then against a hurricane of German men in armor, the little force was overwhelmed. Thanks to a few courageous GIs, fresh Allied divisions were given time to arrive in the Ardennes. And Hitler was learning that a commander must keep his eyes not only on the map, but on the clock. For some, on December 25th, there was a brief timeout in honor of the Prince of Peace. Christmas Day, and my first thought was to kill him. This sniveling nuisance, this two-faced hunk of hate. Who needs him? What good is he? The simplest would be to erase him from this earth. Uh, but then, who am I to judge them? To hold a rifle doesn't make a god. What are they really like, I wonder? Some are old. Some are young. And some are forever lost. Yet steep them in snow and they get frostbite. Scare them and they cry. Wound them and they bleed. What are they really like? They are, most of them, like us. Christmas Day near Parker's Crossroads, a patrol from the American 2nd Armored Division spotted the German 2nd Armored Division nesting in the woods and obviously out of gas. Quickly, the American 2nd Armored got ready for combat while their commander, Ernie Harmon, roared with pleasure, the buzzards are in the bag, in the bag. Soon, they were rolling. On the day after Christmas, the American 2nd Armored met the German 2nd Armored nose to nose in hundreds of bitter duels in the forests and hills. Steadily, panzer after panzer, as promised by Ernie Harmon, was put in the bag. Suddenly, a German column threatened to come to the rescue of their dying comrades. But out of the blue, for it was no longer Hitler weather, the Royal Air Force swooped down. This German threat, too, went up in smoke. Now the GI tanks resumed their headlong drive. Soon they raced into a snow-covered clearing. Ahead were a group of soldiers. The soldiers were American paratroopers. Bastogne was no longer surrounded. Now in January, the Allies decided, with Hitler's troops still pinned down in the bulge, that here and now, then, now was the time for the great counter-blow. Now, despite the deep snow, now when only foot soldiers could maneuver, now in the greatest ordeal any mass American army had ever experienced. Now!
Even as the GIs threatened to cut the bulge in two, the German high command failed to pull their troops out. Hitler was committing the same mistake in the West that he had made in the East at Stalingrad. And again, it was his men who were paying for their dictator's mistakes. Relentlessly, the GI was burying Hitler's final hopes for victory in the snowdrifts along the roads of Belgium. Within a month after Hitler launched his last desperate offensive, the American first and third armies fought to a triumphant junction, thus setting up not only the end of this climactic battle, but of the war itself. These weren't the guys I come in with in the old 83rd. Too many of the old gang have been left behind. Too many of our buddies died in Belgium. And something in us died too. What died was the softness in our bodies and our hearts. It was them or us. Kill them. Kill them. Kill them. That was the only way we'd ever get home. The Germans lost over 100,000 in dead and wounded in the bulge in long, long lines of prisoners. Though American casualties were also heavy, these German soldiers were irreplaceable. And when the Russians rammed straight for Berlin, the Nazis had no reserves with which to stop them. The failure of Hitler's desperate gamble in the West made total disaster inevitable in both East and West. And soon after the great battle ended for these Germans in Belgium, Hitler also was dead and Nazism kaput. The Battle of the Bulge was not only the greatest American victory of all time, but was above all a vindication of the democratic faith in the individual. For the fate of this crucial battle was determined in the first few days of defeat and confusion, when individual GIs by ones and twos and tens, numb in body and spirit, without compulsion or witnesses or reasons they could ever put into words, said to themselves, this is as far as I go. Here I stand and I guess die.